personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds. They call me the Data Diva. This is the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world for the information the businesses need to know now. I have a special guest on the show uh, from India, Divya Duedidi. Uh She is, she's a dynamo. So she's a multifaceted person. Her and I connected on LinkedIn. We really liked each other. And I think since the time we, we met, we kind of had a chat. And then I think I had done something with IAPP in Philippines. You were like a guest <laughs> there. Uh, and we've had, uh, had a lot of, you know, I've had, had a lot of fun, like looking at some of the stuff that you're doing. Um, so you're a practicing advocate at the Supreme Court of India. Uh, you're a results driven engineer, MBA turned lawyer with experience in ensuring the legality of commercial transactions of corporate world, of the corporate world involving fields like AI, uh, IoT, data privacy. So that's not even that's like the tip of the iceberg. So you're involved in many different things. So I want to list out a couple of things you have mentioned here. Founder of JND Charitable Trust, Supreme Court of India, legal engineer, AI ethics and cyber democracy enthusiast, gender equality um, uh, proponent, data ethics and privacy advocate, mentor and public speaker. Wow, that's a list. (laughs) Welcome. I think I have to reduce the list now. (laughs) I'll write data uh, data diva. uh, Guess that's enough for me. I think people will relate to that. (laughs) Well, it's so I'm so thrilled that you were able to do this show with me. Um, You're so multifaceted. eh? You asked me a question. We'll we'll get into it later. This is about gender and privacy, Uh, but it just. I'd never heard anyone say that. I've never heard anybody even describe that. And it was such a fascinating topic, but I just want to throw it out there because I want to mention it later. But I would love for you to introduce yourself and sort of tell about your journey and your interests in privacy. Uh, for that, it will take at least uh, more than a couple of minutes. And I hope you won't mind that. So my journey is uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, I would call crazy. I keep jumping from uh, one to other thought and I really don't understand why it is hard for people to accept that a person can think beyond boundaries of subjects. So if you are learning psychology, why can't you learn technology? And if you are learning philosophy, why can't you at the same time learn AI? There is always a connect. You just have to find that particular connect. For me, data privacy, not specifically data privacy, but privacy has always been an issue for me especially given the fact the place where I belong to. Here we have this culture of uh, being very much involved in the family and outside the uh, family as well in society. So I always had this issue with my mom and family that why do you always have to invite everyone? First, have some distance. That distance factor was always there for me. But then anyways, that I moved on from there and Then when I started studying, I realized that people are not at all aware and they are not interested in safeguarding their own privacy. They are very free in sharing their photographs. They are very easily providing their addresses. They are inviting every other person at their house, even if they have met them a couple of times, which is inherently now kind of unsafe, at least for me and my kind of person. I feel it's unsafe to share your details with anyone and everyone. It should be with the specific people. So this data privacy, uh, frankly, came into mind in uh, way too back, I think uh, at least two decades now. But when data privacy bill came in India, it was in 2019 when it was tabled. But then before that, there was a huge case in India where we got our fundamental right of privacy in 2017. That's when I started understanding and trying to understand as in how much data are we providing to the world and uh, businesses to make it a 
uh, not consumer centric business but business centric business the problem was they are collecting data and how they are using and manipulating nobody knows and we do not have any law and suddenly a bill came in picture and everyone started talking about it so that's how it all made a sense that technology is involved in law and law has to be at the same level as technology is developing so our country also uh, got involved in this we definitely had information technology law but it was not that uh, overpowering for data but then we did have data privacy law in india as well from year 2000 itself uh, but uh, yeah awareness is required and that's what i have been doing for those many decades through my ngo through my awareness camps and i keep on doing them even now yeah i'm glad you mentioned um in 2017 that uh, india made privacy a fundamental human right and have it codified in your law. So I was very excited about that. And I don't know if you've heard any of my other talks. So I talk a lot about India, right? Because I think it's really yeah. fascinating what's happening uh, in India. So I was extremely excited about that. And I wish as the U.S., I wish we could do that. So I that's probably my biggest dream in the U.S. is that we codify privacy as a fundamental human right in our laws somewhere, maybe in the Constitution, because we don't really have that now. And I think a lot of people don't understand the difference because they don't look deeply enough into the issue. So for us, a lot of privacy laws are based on consumer stuff. So if you're not consuming or you can't consume, you know, you can't really exercise your rights. So you don't have a right. I like to say you don't have a right not to share data <laughs> in the U.S. So your right to not share is not protected uh, in the U.S. So it's, it's a very different thing. So when you have a fund fundamental human right to privacy, you have a right to not share. So you have a right to decide, you know, what you will or won't share. And that's very different. Um, let, let, let's talk a bit about, you talked about the data privacy bill that, that came up in 2019. I think people are thinking or hoping maybe this year, 2022, that it'll be finalized. What, what are your thoughts about that? In 2009, it was a personal data protection bill. Now it is data privacy bill. So somehow we have removed personal, but then we have included in definitions non -person, what is non-personal data, what is personal data and everything. But still we do not have right to erasure, which is there in uh, GDPR, that is uh, right to be forgotten. We have not included that, keeping in mind that we do have national security at hand as well to check if some data is being misused or being misprocessed, whatever way. So our country, uh, when government placed this bill, they were very specific about safeguarding their nationals before anything else. Since we in India, we are more duty centric country rather than right centric country like US. So we first think about fulfilling the duties beforehand, then asking for our rights. So that is how privacy actually became the fundamental right in 2017. And that's after the uh, Supreme Court gave that judgment. We now in our data protection bill this year, as in last year in 2021, which was tabled, specifically are talking about data localization as well. As in how hard or soft that localization should be, that will be decided according to the kind of data which we'll be sharing. But government is very specific about making it local because the kind of data which India is providing, since we are the second largest in population, frankly, we are providing a lot of data to the businesses. But there is no control of government over those data and how they are being processed or used, even for educative purposes or making sure that consumer are being served better still that data has to be processed in a certain manner that privacy is not infringed so i feel that somehow government is trying to protect first the uh, individual rights of citizens then think about the national security and probably at the third place it will talk about businesses because at the end of the day data is mostly used as an oil for businesses now they are consuming data the provided by us and they are using it to give us better better services i'm not denying that we are not getting better better services but there is a limit to that service as well 
So that was one specific thing. Then data anonymization has been introduced in words. And let's see if it becomes a reality this year. We really will be very happy that at least finally we have a data protection law. But let's see what happens. But it is already tabled. So we practically have introduced a couple of new things. Mostly uh, what was for me, it was intriguing, was localization specifically because it will affect a larger community of business it is going to affect them most than the consumers and then the producers of the data other than that we have talked about a lot about the global concern like everyone now is talking about data privacy because gdpr is so strict even in us it's very strict data privacy bill data privacy laws but then india was not such country which wants to actually curb all these kind of privacies and they do not want to make it only business centric or uh, right centric we want to have better outputs with good inputs so now i i feel that this data privacy will here they have talked about even mental health can you imagine i was really surprised when i was reading about it that uh, we we have talked about how data privacy breaches are going to affect our well-being and mental health and uh, it was uh, for me it's very intriguing bill and i enjoyed reading it though it is a long uh, joint committee building place they have given a whole report on it it's it's uh, amazing and uh, i really love to talk about mental health uh, and you too i have heard a lot of your recordings and it, it, I enjoyed it, Shirley, and you really talk a lot about India as well, which was quite uh, uh, fun to listen, you know. I listened it a couple of days ago as well, so that I can prepare for Data Diva. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, it's really fascinating. So I have been doing work in India for decades, right? So I know a lot about kind of data and stuff like that, and so... I know that India for a long time has been very strict on data localization as it relates to banking data, right? Um, and I think that as the cloud has progressed, India is looking at how to figure out, you know, what's the best way to do that localization, knowing that, um, you know, there are companies that do kind of global business. And one of the reasons why I'm really excited to see what happens in India is because, um, you know, as you said, um, you know, India, I, I tell people all the time, it's like there are more people in India than are in the EU and the U.S. combined. Right. So being the largest democracy, you know, there's a lot of money, you know, being put into India. You know, all these big companies are all around the world are looking very closely at what happens in India um, because it can be. Uh, an example, I feel, for other democracies that want to sort of go into data privacy. So, um, and also, I think, you know, you have the luxury, to, in my view, to, to have seen how some of these other laws are being implemented around the world and see what works for you. So it isn't, you know, it isn't a one size fit all thing. Um, I think one of my friends, Pedro Pavone, he said, he said it best. He said, you know, not everyone in the world thinks about privacy in the same way. So understanding kind of the cultural differences and how people think about privacy. And I love what you said about duty. I never heard anyone say that, right? So people think, oh, oh I have a fundamental human right or I have a consumer right, but having a duty-based right, that's even better in my view, because if you have a duty, then it sort of automatically ties what you're doing with the data to the purpose, right? So if without the purpose, you don't have the, the duty, right, <laughs> in, in some ways. What are your thoughts? Oh, okay. This came from when our constitution was being written, and it goes way back to Mahatma Gandhi. He always believed in fulfilling the duties first before asking for your rights. And that's what was inculcated in our constitution as well. And even our parents, uh, the kind of nurture we get in school, that they're also first question, if there is some problem, first question which is asked to the students, did you complete your homework or not? Because if you have done that part, then only you can ask whether 
why i was being thrown out of the class or not thrown out of the class so if you have fulfilled your duties practically for the society then only you are supposed to claim your rights that's what we are being taught since childhood and i believe say if i if i can give an example like if we are uh, going on traffic light and there is a red light if one stops other person automatically understands that that person is obeying the red light you have to stop so that is how people learn that we have completed this particular duty so when it will go green i can move but if you have jumped the red light you have no right to go ahead and say no i had an emergency and i had to jump the light even if you have an emergency you can always stop for 30 seconds there is no emergency except couple that you have to jump a red light so that is very common example other than that there are so many instances where we have to complete our duty being a child we have to complete a duty towards our parents then towards our partners then towards the society for us it is the society first are you being a good neighbor are you being a good society person are you being a, 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 a if you if you are in a cleaning job you are are you completing your duty if you are then you are actually rightful owner of your fundamental rights so that's how our constitution was built on these scenarios so now coming to even data when we talk about first duty of ours is to know how to be hygienic about your data what to share when to share how to share and why not to share all these awarenesses have to be inculcated like we are as humans if we are hungry we know we have to eat similarly when you are doing using data or using social network you are supposed to know what you should share or what you should not share i always say this it's not like fine there are so many people who are sitting just to have some cyber hacking or something like that to affect your life or general public's life or government's life fine but still it doesn't give you a right to go ahead and open whole of your life and then say that my life was infringed because someone breached my account and took my photographs if you are posting thousands of photographs in thousands of places you really do not know where to pinpoint which social media to point so first duty comes for data is to understand what kind of data we are sharing there are so many people who share their intimate photographs then they share their documents they do not realize what document we are sharing if this is a government website government is asking for some document to clarify that whether these documents are real or not perfectly fine you share it there but why do you have to post it on social media the moment you do that you are providing your data your uh, say we have aadhar you have shown it to the world why are you doing that aadhar is a government identity given to us or pan id which is given to us by tax department you are not supposed to post it online all the time there is no need so i, I believe that if you are being conscious about what you are sh sharing you really know which photograph or which document you shared where and you can claim if something god forbid if something happens you can definitely go ahead and claim for that so i i feel that that first duty has to be fulfilled you have to be careful yeah education is key i i love the way that you say that uh right so people do need more education they need to know especially younger people i hate saying that but <laughs> I thought so I was younger, so now I say younger people. I sound like my mother or something. Uh, uh, you know, people who grew up with the internet. You know, they don't they don't have say. You know, they didn't have those same barriers that we had to sharing. Right? It makes the internet makes sharing easy. It makes it so easy that it's almost dangerous to some people because they don't know. You know, a lot of people don't have. the idea that someone would do something bad right with their data so when they share they're not thinking that they're not thinking down the line this could be a bad thing but you know we all know that that's really true i want to move on to gender and privacy so you said you posed this question to me and i was just blown away i was like oh my god i never heard anybody say anything and it's it was so true so Talk to me about the relationship between gender and privacy. Like you had asked me or posed me a question about can privacy be gender, and I thought, oh my god, yes, <laughs> I think so. 
Tell me more about that. So, okay. Uh, I get this question most of the times that why do you connect gender with everything? But I believe gender is definitely connected with everything. Uh, first, I'll explain how data is gendered and then I'll explain how privacy is affecting gender and how gender is affecting privacy. So when we talk about data, we see there is an inclination of infringement of privacy for women most of the times. If they have posted their photographs, if they have posted their details, there is a good chance that people will be more inclined towards finding that female's details rather than compared to a male's details. So that is where the discrimination or differentiation happens. People are very much inclined towards understanding, like early, in earlier times when Facebook started in India, there were even males who were making uh, their accounts with women names and photographs and this and that, and they used to talk to people. And this is also this was also a way of uh, forging and fraud and other uh, different kinds of crime online. That is how I uh, found out that there is a huge connect in between kind of gender data, which we are not understanding right now. First, like I told you that we have to be aware about it. It has nothing to do with kind of education you had, but if you are being told one thing again and again, that this is supposed to be your limitation. And this is where you have to stop your life from posting online. Why I say that gender and data has a huge connect that whenever it comes to stopping a child in the house from using internet or posting something online, it is always a female first. They are being told, no, you are not supposed to use online things or you are like earlier it was, you are not supposed to go outside. Now that has stopped. So people have shifted to, you, you are not supposed to have a mobile phone. You're not supposed to be online. You're not supposed to have a social media account. Why? Give them the real reason. Give them that awareness that you can be online, but these are the specifics. That being said, other than this, when, when there are details available for like, uh, uh, how should I give you this example? There, there, is, there was a time when we were doing a survey related to kind of how many uh, households are sending girls to school and how many households are not sending and why they're not sending. Reason was specific that if they will go out, there is a chance that they'll be having an affair or maybe they'll be manipulated, this and that. Isn't the same thing happening online as well? It's a similar kind of thing. In India, it has happened left, right, and center that girls have ran away from the house just by chatting online. And that's how they were manipulated. That's how trafficking happened. It, there has been a humongous number of cases where um, uh, trafficking has happened through online chatting. People have met through mobile phones. They have talked, and that's how it happened. So coming to the privacy part, Privacy is very important for everyone. But like you said, culture also has a huge impact on it. The culture in India has always been very inclusive. We believe in society, being open to society, being, uh, being very, very diverse and very, very inclusive. But what we forgot with the advent of internet, with the advent of phone and coming in India and laptops and computers and internet connectivity, that we have to educate our kids in the similar manner. We have to exponentially generate the awareness as in whom and how to talk. Like there is something called good touch and bad touch, which is being now taught in India, but it was taught in US since childhood. In US, I have learned that kids are being taught, taught about cyber crimes from class one, K1 to K12, they are being taught. But in India, it has now started, which should have started 20 years ago. So that's how I relate these things. Final point which I would like to make, why I talk about gender, if a female in the house is being educated and made aware that this is supposed to be the check and balance for your kid, I think that's how, that household will be much more safe. Now what happens is the only father who knows exactly what to say and fathers are usually being accepted the, universally that they will not be so close to children. It will always be the mother. So first educate the mother. 
why are you not doing that educate the mother educate the grandmother educate the women around they will make sure that their children are safe so i relate gender data and privacy in this manner and i try and target those women first to educate or make aware rather than men because they are going out they know what kind of the world we are living in they try and save guard themselves but they are not that open in the house so similarly i i try to do this in rural areas i hardly have worked uh, in urban areas so i enjoy doing it in rural areas and women are very very open minded when it comes to taking care of their children and when i was teaching them or guiding them this is how you have to make sure that your kid is not online doing something wrong they were very very open and they understood they are trying to do their best other than that it's always your fate as well whatever however you play that's how i connect Wow, that's amazing. Um, I was talking, I we have a podcast with Karen Bright. Um, she uh, has a company, Understanding Identity. And she had brought up an example about, and this was in England, actually, where she was saying, you know, there were certain immigrant women, maybe they didn't speak the language very well. And a lot of them defer to, you know, husbands or nephews or brothers to help them just to do things having to do with their identity. So a lot of them didn't have the agency, I would say, to actually do things with their identity. And then, you know, that has privacy implications. You know what I'm saying? So when you're talking about education and knowing what you can do, if that that responsibility is deferred somehow to someone else, maybe you don't have a full understanding of what's happening. And, and like you said, education is key. I want to talk a little bit about The Hague. So um, you had recently finished a certificate at The Hague, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, you know what? I've always wanted, I always hoped that The Hague would sort of jump in. And, you know, obviously they have their conventions, right, about data sharing. I actually did a video a while back about evidence sharing in The Hague, but Hague Convention. Uh, but I always hoped that they would do something around data privacy. <laughs> well, what are your thoughts about that? Well, lucky for me in the session which I attended last year, it was summer session, it was for six weeks. They actually talked about cybersecurity and data privacy both. And they are now talking about having universal guidelines like we already have. But they are talking about in, it in terms of cybersecurity specifically. Because if you see, data privacy also comes under the umbrella of, I would say, AI, because AI is the uh, kind of tree. Uh, all its roots are there. And then you have to find the branches. So cybersecurity is there. Cyber psychology is there. Interestingly, they talked about that as well. Then there is data. Then there is privacy. And then there is data privacy. And I enjoyed those lectures. Obviously, they, they are very... Uh, big people who talk about it so i was fascinated by how they were talking but what they what what i understood from all these lectures was that everybody wants a universal system which should be equal for every place but i do not agree to that fact because if, like you said every uh, culture and demography that makes a lot of difference every country every state cannot be similarly treated there is nothing called equality between equals. It will always be equality between unequals. You have to find a way how to make equality possible for every unequal uh, being. So if culture in India is different, culture in US is different, culture in Africa is different, Australia is different. So you have to find ways to have similar kind of situation, but in different demographics. So when everyone says that this should be followed as it is in the other country, it is not possible. That's why India being the biggest dem democracy in the world, we try here to make sure that whatever laws we make here should be generic and should be acceptable by the countrymen. Because it is our country and we have to run it according to the needs of the people. So when... Uh, in, in Hague, there are a couple of professors who specifically were talking about having a, a cyber security law, like AI law for the world, similarly cyber security law for the world. 
so i always had this question we you, we were supposed to send emails so my question was this only how can you propose a universal cyber security law keeping in mind us has a different kind of privacy norms and privacy regime they do not exactly follow the same process as gdpr then how can you ask them to have the same security cyber security law international laws are always soft laws they are not that hard one that you have to follow them it is just kind of guideline which you put at a center and you can pick the pieces as and when required it becomes integral and important when when there are states fighting on some issue which is important for the other states as well but you cannot impose it so if there is no imposition even he cannot do anything rather un they are only a suggestive body they are not like they they cannot impose anything on any country whoever wants to sign they can sign like we signed our patent um, we, our patent act came in 2005 we had signed it in 1995 we had a 10 year time where we could frame it according to our needs and every country has an issue with one section of our patent act as well but that is for us because we are agriculture based country we cannot open everything we cannot have so coming back to data as well like now every other person always questions like you have worked in india that why are you talking about data localization it's very important for us we cannot just open every data and we cannot give it to other places where we cannot claim our rights so we have to make sure that our citizens rights are being saved so that's how i picked it up from hague and it was quite fun three or six weeks were awesome it was public and uh, private international law both so in both of them privacy definitely came into picture but what you are proposing i really hope it reaches them i can rather i will <laughs> request couple of professors to get introduced to you so that you can propose that option over there that please talk about it and call me <laughs> i definitely would love to i definitely would love to you know i didn't even think about data localization in the way that you just described it which is if if it is harder to enforce the laws around data if this all over the place right so i never thought about <laughs> i never thought about data localization in that way that makes sense actually uh because you want it, it, you know unless i guess you say in order for you to take this data you have to be subject to our jurisdiction i guess that's kind of how uh the gdpr does it um i i would love to talk to you about the apec privacy framework i i like this framework I, to me i like it because it's sort of doing in some way what the privacy shield in the EU was trying to do <laughs> which was say okay we here's a framework here this is what you need to follow and one of the things i really like about the framework is that it it acknowledges from the very beginning is that you know countries are different right so our laws are not going to be the same let's find ways that we can agree right that when we work together that we want to agree to this framework or these principles what what are your thoughts about that well it's a huge thing to talk about frankly but i'll uh, try and wrap up in couple of sentences like uh, uh, what i would like to add here is they have tried to talk about choice uh, which choice of nations which are involved and that somehow gives you and uh, uh, a broader perspective to any law other than that they have also tried to implement the kind of uh, integrity like you said that personal information how and where and when to be shared there are cultures which are different there are domestic implications uh, uh, as well as international other than that there are implementation options as well so all these scopes which are being given by this particular framework i think we are moving towards a um, uh, asia centric privacy law but then i think still all the states will have different laws for themselves because every state has a different kind of citizen to cater to 
we can have a similar kind of framework here we can work around that particular implementation part as they have given an option that if you follow this particular thing you can have your own domestic implementation process and you can have your own uh, uh, way how you want to safeguard your citizens but again they have to give that option debbie the problem is uh, we are so diversified we are so different in understanding any concept we just cannot impose it again i will keep on saying this particular imposition word because imposition is something which which affects us psychologically the moment someone says that you have to impose this particular thing on another person we feel like we are not being given a choice so when you are talking about choice there is no imposition it has to be soft law it can or cannot be followed to the letter like we say you have to follow the law by the letter no this law cannot be followed that way it is just a, a explanation or a kind of principle given that please if you can follow you can be in this particular asia pacific community and you will be given the same kind of rights in other countries as well like it is said that wherever we go we follow, we take our laws with us we do not leave our law of the land if say if i move to us it doesn't mean my laws in india will not follow me they are with me because i am an indian citizen so that's how i think that's my understanding i may be wrong i'm not saying but that's how i try and understand law from the perspective of people who work on the ground from the perspective of people who are social workers because see they everywhere social work is of different kind so when you are talking about imposing this kind of law which is universal for asia specifically Asia also is a very big continent have different culture even here we are sitting in india then in sri lanka there is a different culture then nepal we have a different culture in china there is different culture then pakistan is different culture so all of us have different different kind of laws all privacy laws cannot be same they can be on the similar ground they can be given choice or they cannot be given choice it depends on the government kind of security we are dealing with and kind of equality we are talking about i'll again come back to gender because this is also going to affect gender uh gender i believe that gender equality is going to be answer to many questions which we always keep raising even in relation to data privacy if we give equal rights if we give equal choices i think we'll have better results Wow, that's amazing. That's a tour de force answer. Uh, uh, I, I want to talk with you a bit about artificial intelligence um, and privacy. So artificial intelligence, as a result of COVID, a lot of things that were being developed with artificial intelligence are accelerating um, because, you know, organizations needed to find ways to do things differently, uh, right? Uh, as a result of, you know, people being sick or trying to automate or, you know, even smaller businesses looking to gain more efficiencies with kind of less people. So we're seeing kind of an acceleration of AI, but the thing with acceleration of AI is that there really aren't any guardrails, right? <laughs> with AI right now. So you know, I'm happy to see that you're, you talk about this. I saw a talk that you had done uh, about legal aspects of artificial intelligence. So t- tell me a bit about your concern about sort of AI, maybe sort of mixed in privacy in there as well. <laughs> AI is everywhere. Maybe it's, it has not started because of pandemic, but then somehow it has taken a jump. i would say what we would have been talking after like a decade we have started talking immediately in like couple of years now so um, i mostly talk about ethical aspects of ai the kind of ethical principles which we talk about like transparency fairness accountability privacy obviously it comes in that particular arena itself and most important like i said accountability how do you make anything accountable if if we are building an ai see how are we expecting it to be accountable the privacy factor the the particular algorithm which we which will build around privacy that will make it more accountable 
like you you recently had a talk with Ryan i think so he talks about ai audit that is a very important um, field you know and no one is actually talking i have never heard other than ryan or for humanity to talk about ai audits that is going to give us an upper edge in understanding why it is very important to have data privacy to make sure that they are accountable but before that i always have this question why are we trying to make ai so accountable are we as humans who are building that particular ai are we that much accountable really we always have flaws we accept humans with their flaws so why are we expecting that whatever machines we are building all of a sudden they will not be biased or they will not be um, uh, accountable you can make them accountable no problem with that but do not expect it to be accountable from the day one we are just building it it is getting built it's kind of a child which we are nurturing we are we, we are trying to build an ai uh, atmosphere but we have to make sure that those principles are followed even humans we deviate from our own plan right we are supposed to be moral we are supposed to be ethical but don't we miss it aren't humans criminals so think about it like this like uh, uh, the vehicles which uh, are being uh, run by ai we say that if it kills somebody who will be accountable will it be the ai driving the car or the person who has made it or the company who has made it first understand how will that happen why did that accident happen if everything is so automated how will that accident happen i'm not saying that it will not happen just try and understand the whole scenario keep the whole environment around you and then try and understand accountability question is not wrong we try and make companies also accountable government also accountable but that doesn't mean there are not flaws so accept it with its flaw and work around it so that it becomes more accountable we believe that whatever we have built since it is a machine it should be totally non biased that is not going to happen we have to accept it with its flaw and try to remove those flaws in the uh, in the process itself that's my understanding and i i may be wrong i may maybe uh, my uh, my things may be wrong in understanding but that's what i feel that since we accept humans with their flaws we have to accept machines with their flaws yeah yeah that's fascinating i never thought about it that way you know being as a woman and a woman of color as as are you you know bias in, in artificial intelligence concerns me greatly um especially because i feel like some first of all i think the biggest hurdle we have is people who don't believe that there is bias in ai so there is bias in life right Uh, so if we are humans and we're building AI, we're going to build AI, unfortunately, that has those biases in it. But the problem is when we're using AI, we're pretending like it doesn't, it's perfect, right? We're pretending like it has no flaws and it's not perfect. It does have flaws. So I think, especially in situations where can affect someone's life or liberty, you know, we need to definitely look into that more deeply. So it can't be a thing where you're like, okay, well, computers are perfect, you know, software is perfect, you know, we don't have to see, you know, we don't we, you know, I whoever designed this system, it doesn't harm me, so I'm going to assume that it's not going to harm other people, and we know that that's not how it works, right? So I'm concerned about the exponential efficiency of ai to to multiply the harm of individuals what are your thoughts about that again i'll come back to the same human bias uh, if we as humans we are biased towards race we are biased towards gender we are biased towards color we are biased pretty much about everything we are very judgmental race we humans <laughs> no one can say that i do not judge the other person right. the moment you feel you are better than the other person you start judging that person so when we are building a machine how can you say that it has to be totally perfect we are not perfect we really have no definition of perfect anywhere i have never heard anybody say that this is the definition of perfect and this is how we are we find flaws in our gods as well 
no no this this also has happened he did this or she did this so we try and compensate everything by arguing but machines are not tr trying to argue yet they may argue later but they 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 will grow maybe later but why are we worried so much we are not worried about what kind of data we are feeding it with what kind of algorithm are we uh, uh, drawing it around what kind of bias we are putting in there, there is so much bias there was a book i was reading by Pat patrick he has written machine see machine do you should read it it's an amazing book. He has given so many examples from US itself that even the bridges were made in a manner that they should not re reach to a certain community. They should ignore that particular community, bus community and that buses should cross so that they cannot get an access to bus. This is not done. And being humans, we have accepted that. We are perfectly fine with it. We, we are okay with human issues. But why are we not okay with AI issues? It's not like AI is saying that you just give me the world and I'm taking over. No, we are the ones which are running AI. First accept your own flaws and then run after AI. We ourselves do not accept our own flaws. We go ahead and question others. We judge others and then say, no, no, this is the machine and it should run in a proper manner. Then this becomes a very... Uh, for me, it is a very curious case, you know. I feel like it's kind of vicious circle. We always keep on circling around the same thing. Are we ethical? Why is it not ethical? Why is it not moral? Why is it not fair? You are fair. As human, are you fair? Even if you ask me, I may not have been fair with so many people. We are talking here on international level, but still I'm saying I may not have been fair. I'm not saying I'm the perfect human being. No one can say that. Everyone has definitely had some wrongdoing sometime. You may have lied sometime, may not be bigger lie, but it must have happened. So don't think what we are building will become totally fair. It will become totally transparent. No, transparency is a different thing. It may find flaws in the things which humans may have hidden it while doing audit. But it will not make it crystal clear because we as humans, we have a tendency of hiding things. The day we do not hide, the way do not, we do not have jealousy, we will have no war itself. We'll have so much peace in the world. You just have to find peaceful minds. That's why I, I also have talked about spiritual AI, which earlier um, in a couple of groups, uh, everyone was like, why are you talking about it? I said, I'm not talking about AI and spirituality. I'm saying make AI spiritual. Give it peaceful mind, make it not judgmental, make it more fair, which we read in books, but in reality, we do not have. Because if you see a couple of movies, even AI, when it gains consciousness, it asks, why, uh, why did you lie? It tells the human itself. And we did not have any answer. Because we really don't know why we lie. We just lie. We, we just want to get away from, uh, get away with whatever. So please be perfect first and then try and make machines perfect. We are not perfect. Yeah, totally. Right. That's fascinating. Oh, wow. I think the audience is really going to love this episode. Uh, so if it were the world according to Divya and we did everything that you said, what would be your wish for privacy anywhere in the world, whether it be law, technology, human stuff? What do you think? Wow. What have you asked and why have you asked? We should be peaceful in our heads, so we will be private anyways. Um, remove the judgment, remove uh, the judging part from your heart and try and be diligent as in what you are sharing and with whom you are sharing. I'm not saying have faith on everyone, but try and have faith on humanity. And I think privacy will be there it will be there but if we become a larger community a bigger one i think privacy should not be an issue anyways because see your data is yours and if you have a right to safeguard it i think no company no business will have a um, option of taking it away from you like there are so many cases in uk itself where right to be forgotten was being um, uh, entertained by courts they have given that option so I think we will have a nice, uh, beautiful, peaceful world if privacy becomes a norm and people become diligent about what they are sharing.
That's that's amazing. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being on the show. And I know the audience really like it. And uh, uh, thank you for the shout out to Ryan Carrier, who's the founder of For Humanity. Uh, definitely check out his episode and For Humanity as well. It's a great organization. And they talk a lot about AI and audits and things like that. So thank you so much, Divya, for being on the show. I'm sure we're going to cross paths again. And I look forward to opportunities to collaborate collaborate in the future. Absolutely, Ravi. Thank you so much for the invite. Thank you. And I hope I, I someday host you in India. Oh, yeah, totally. Thank you so much. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Thank you.